You shall come to know us as after credits, the movie slayers. But until new releases are the norm, you'll be getting more Avatar. That is, and if you want to support us during these strange days of 2020, you can visit us over at patreon.com slash Productions. More or less than the cost of the moon, you can support our show. That's early episodes, bonus content, and exclusive episodes just for you. Don't get lost in a fog on these deals. That's patreon.com slash Productions. Enjoy the show. You want to catch Penapox? Wear a goddamn mask. Welcome to the After Credits Cast, one of the only film podcasts to remind you to do your part to reduce the impact of deadly diseases. I want to be able to go back to movie theaters regularly, you know, like a normal person. I am your host, AJ Waseska, and I am joined by my co-hosts, uh, Ryan Metters, and of course, this week, Nicole Mendez. Glad to be back. OG podcast. We're only missing Max and Aaron, yeah. and then we had the whole crew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I miss Max. How's he? Has, does anyone know how he's doing? Yeah, I just saw him this weekend. Oh yeah, yeah. So he's still good. He is still alive then. Okay. Yeah, he's still <laughs> alive. I don't know about now. He may be dead. Who knows? Yeah, I love the conversation we had yesterday I mean, with with the whole in laws moving out. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I mean, he could just be a ghost that we're talking to. Who uh, knows? Yeah, you know, you're, you're probably right. You're probably right. He's yeah. probably just a ghost. Um, yeah, he's a ghost. Speaking of ghosts, uh, we, 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 we want you guys to, to very much be alive and to go to our various uh, links down below, including YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, uh, Patreon, of course, and uh, Pippa, and uh, other places. You can find us all over the internet, um, Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook as well. And Ryan, if they aren't dead and they aren't ghosts, they could email us, but where would they email us at? Uh, they could email us at... King Boomy can fucking face bend? What the hell even is? I'm sorry. That's a long email. Mm. Yes, you're right. Nope, that's incorrect. It's evacstation at gmail.com. See, the only face bender I'm familiar with is Nick Cage. I didn't realize that uh, Boomy yes. could do that too. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is King Bo- Boomy Nick Cage? Oh, God. Oh, my God. No. King Boomy <laughs> is Ko, the face stealer. I that's why he can face bend. I knew it. Shit. I knew it. Boys, we've we've blown the lid right off of it. The massive Omashu conspiracy. Yup, get to Reddit. Get to Reddit. It's it's, it's revealed. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, speaking of reveals, uh, this week we're doing side A, uh, which is the return to Omashu, originally airing April sixth of two thousand and six. I was actually street legal the day before this uh, this episode came out. Fun fact. Street legal. <laughs> <laughs> I could drive. I could drive. Oh my god. Also, I feel yes. old now. I feel really old. Uh, directed yeah. directed yeah. by Ethan Spaulding. It's his series debut. And written uh, by uh, Elizabeth Welsh uh, uh, Iez. Uh, animated by DR Movie. Uh, some new voices to the cast include Paul mm-hmm. Eiding as the governor. Uh, te- uh, Fred, some name I can't pronounce, as the resistance leader. Uh, Robin Atkin Downs as the Rainmaster uh, Shuzumu. Uh, Tara Strawn as Tom Tom because let's get a high profile actor like Tara Strawn for a baby. Hell yeah. <laughs> to the baby! <laughs> I love Tara Strong. Uh, Cricket Lee as May and Olivia Hack as Ty Lee. I like that, the game's uh, all here. Azula's Angels coming back. Yep. <laughs> God, I wish they had done a spinoff called Azula's Angels. That'd be cool. Right? <laughs> uh, Ryan, you have some fun facts for me? I do, I do indeed. Uh, first of which, in Return to Omashu with Avatar Extras bonus commentary, it was mentioned that the Fire Nation's plan was to make the entire city of Omashu earthbending proof. To this extent, they began in covering the entire city in metal, which is really, really interesting, and I really wish they would have brought that up in the episode. <laughs> yeah. Especially because then you find out that one of the that's, earthbenders that's could just break really, that. Like, yeah. Yeah, well, well, well yeah. I mean, once once Toph shows up, it's just like, oh, fuck, come on, guys. <laughs> I mean, that's just Toph in a nutshell. Like, oh, shit, Toph's here. Yep, yep. Uh, last fun fact for this episode. Uh, 
the Fire Nation circus that Ty Lee was performing with is actually the very same one that Appa will be sold to in Appa's Lost Days. Oh, oh man, I'm not ready oh. for how mad I am going to be. I'm in not that crying, shit. you're crying. <laughs> and I was ready to throw hands with <laughs> anybody when Appa got, got taken. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, mean, I had never rooted for a twelve-year-old to commit murder so much. I mean, I mean, not to victim blame here, but couldn't have Alpha just flown higher and not getting caught by the nets? I mean, could have. Just saying. <laughs> oh my. Uh, so I have, How dare I, you? I have synopsis here for you to get that uh, that uncomfortableness out of, you, out of your mouth there. Um, <laughs> so uh, the gang uh, team and tee their way into Omashu all in to discover that the Fire Nation has taken over, and Boomy's surrender allowed them to do that. Uh, they advise the local resistance to leave, pretending to have Wave 2 COVID-19. Uh, they are asked to leave the city, but the governor's son has gone missing as well. Just when the game goes to return him in exchange for Boomy, Azula arrives with her new team of femme fatales. Uh, fighting happens, Boomy tells Aang to go find another teacher, so the game leaves Boomy to his seemingly increasing, uh, seemingly increasing insanity. Yep, that's, 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 yeah, that's, 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 that's that, that, that sums it up pretty good. Um, I mm -hmm. had this to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole the whole thing with Boomy was weird. Like, so it's not really a question I've got, but I guess I am curious what your thoughts on the whole thing. Like, I get that Toph is what we're here for. <laughs> Toph is, is 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 the man, woman, mm -hmm. man, woman. Um, but um, uh, Boomy's rationale is sort of interesting like he could easily just get out escape and tj Aang real quick and do his business and that's it but i don't know do you think Aang's progress and train would have gone better with boomy or even would it have been any good at all um i don't know i'm doubtful i kind of picture them like just kind of like goofing off a lot of the time and not actually like maybe like teaching Aang or maybe like teaching him in like a roundabout way that he may not necessarily get hmm. yeah I mean I, I don't think it would have been a bad teacher but I absolutely think that yeah. is, is like the teacher that Aang absolutely needed mm -hmm. also it made it like from a meta perspective, the concept of Aang as an avatar and the future that Aang will have to preside over being shaped by the people that will live in it with him rather yeah. than the masters of the past. Like mm -hmm. you learn things from the masters of the past, but Aang's <laughs> true masters are the people like around his own age. And I think from a meta perspective, that actually is very insightful and very impactful for them to decide that. So it could be that Umi thought that. I think it I think it's more just a meta perspective, but the fact that Bumi needed to stay, stay in order to liberate the entire city by his goddamn self is oh, is <laughs> actually a fair that's that's a fair move. That's a fair yeah. thing. It's like I want to teach you, but my city is literally overrun and I'm I can only do it but I have to wait for my moment so yeah. you're going to have to find somebody else. I think that's that's a fair that's a fair thing to ask. Yeah. Okay. Um sorry I was just typing a thing there. Uh yeah, mm -hmm. no I, I get you. And I, and I actually really do like the meta re meta reference you were uh, alluding to there and I think that actually really does um add a bit of weight to the choices Ain makes for teachers. I'm actually looking forward to seeing how that plays out more. Like, I mean, I know I've seen it, but like now knowing that and kind of really using that as like a ref frame of reference there, it actually does kind of reframe how I'm looking at the master uh, mentor or mentee mentor relationship between some of these characters. It's actually pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, why was the governor's reaction to a plague in his city to release all the citizens into the world outside of Amashu? <laughs> <laughs> Because he can't didn't, get us all. Because he didn't care about the people who had contain who had con who had contracted the disease or anybody outside of his his city. He just cared about the Fire Nation and of uh, the Fire Nation citizens that didn't have it. So he was like, "I'm going to contain the spread in the city." But what about 
the spread outside of the city. I don't care. I'm not their governor. So. <laughs> not my problem. Yeah. Seems like a very, uh, very right wing way to approach that problem. <laughs> mm. It's the Fire Nation, dog. No, I. I, I... <laughs> it's the Fire Nation. Oh, no. I know. I know. I, I was trying to be not subtle about it. <laughs> Literally the Red State. Yeah. Literally the Red State. <laughs> Um, but no, like, I, I just laugh at it because I'm like, okay, so you're releasing them now to prevent your city from being infected. Question for you, what happens when this inevitably spread, this fake disease, obviously, what would happen if this fake disease inevitably spread around the world and got back to the Fire Nation because you failed to contain it? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But at uh, least (laughs) Omashu is clean. (laughs) Like, fucking Ozai would rip this guy a new asshole for sure. (laughs) Oh, Oh, yeah. I mean, if Azula didn't beat him to it first, of course. He mm-hmm. he he wasn't the smartest fucking fucking governor, man. No, not at all. Oh, really God, no. Um, speaking of Azula, of course, uh, why are May and Ty Lee friends with Azula? Are they even considered friends, honestly? Because she is terrifying and kind of bullies him into it. I, I, I so think... she she actively bullies Ty Lee into friendship. <laughs> Uh, but for May, I think they they share a they share a bond of not really caring about shit. <laughs> Didn't Azula and Mai go to like the same school? So like they're friends by association. Maybe, but like there's a bunch of kids in their <laughs> school. Probably, I'm sure they could have anyone of a good friends. I'm trying to think why Mai in particular. Yeah would be drawn to Azula. Probably because Mai is the only one who was like, yeah, I'll deal with your shit. Isn't that what friendship is, just dealing with each other's shit? I mean, you would would know, Nicole, (laughs) you've known me for like almost, what, 10 years now? 20 years? That's a lot of shit I've had to deal with. I know, too much shit. Someone get a pooper scooper. Yeah, and Tylee is just like looking for, like, looking for her own place. And of course the universe says it's it's with They're just... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's it's not know, I... her fucking finagling you into being in a really really dangerous situation and be like oh i'm gonna keep doing this until you say yes like i kind of think of azula and ty lee's relationship like, like that march simpson meme of i think it's just neat <laughs> so, i kind of picture it as azula being like i like this one she's just neat <laughs> just neat. Imagining Tylee as a potato is actually kind of sad, though, because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so speaking of Tylee, though, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, Chi blocking thing? That was pretty slick. Oh. It's dope. I, like I mentioned, like, like if, if we didn't have Jet in episode 10, we wouldn't have paved the way for badass non-benders. And it make mm-hmm. it it's really, really cool that Azula's elite fucking squad that can go toe to toe with the gang is mm-hmm. just her and two non vendors that are just yeah. skillful enough to keep up with a firebending prodigy. So, well, I mean, damn. Yeah, fantastic. In the case of Mai, I'm not really sure if her knife throwing is that spectacular. Like, I mean, it's against any normal person, yeah, that would probably kill him. But, like, against the benders in general, it seems like it's a little underpowered. Like, not, like, bad, just a little underpowered. Especially when you go up against someone like Toph, who's like, oh, metal knives? Pfft, whatevs. Um, but uh, Ty Lee is, I think, the, the most dangerous of the two. Just because she could stop their bending, and then if you've never trained on anything else, you, you've got nothing else. <clears throat> yeah. to, be, to be fair, though, everybody's underpowered when they come against Toph. So let's 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 <laughs> yeah. let's write that down. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I do I do get what you're saying and it it, it, it does kind of seem that way, but it feels like Mai's offensive is enough to keep most vendors on their toes so that they can't really they're they're focused more on defending themselves against the skillful throws of razor sharp knives as opposed to actually doing some type of offense. Whereas <laughs> As with Ty Lee, if she gets close to you, you're, you're fucked. So it's like you yeah. have to be offensive in order to keep her away from you. It's kind of, it's kind of like a sword and shield almost for Azula. A little bit, yeah. I can, I can kind of see that. Mm, yeah. Now I'm just picturing 
Azula like holding on to my and Ty Lee. <laughs> yeah, just just swinging my and Ty Lee around by their by yeah. Their Isn't that what friends do? Yeah. And of course, you can already imagine Ty Lee making this lightsaber noises just to make it more interesting for her. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what friendship is all about? No! Using each other as swords? Yeah, I think so. Ryan, if I picked you up and swung you like a sword, tell me you wouldn't make the lightsaber noise. I would make a what the fuck are you doing noise. <laughs> Dude, if, if she. Look, I would just ask. Dude, yeah. if she picked me up to use me as a sword, I'd be like, how the fuck did you get so freakishly strong? Yeah. <laughs> I would there, there, there would be like them. 18, there would be like 18 questions that I would have to answer before my mind even <laughs> thought about, oh yeah, lightsaber noise. Look, Ryan, if I came up to you and just asked you, are you ready? And then picked you up <laughs> and swung you like a sword with air as like, a I shield. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. You didn't make the answer. <laughs> Oh, that's my secret, Ryan. I'm always ready. Yep. Aaron, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Let's go. See? This is what friendship is. <laughs> Picking your other friend up like a sword, and he makes lightsaber noises. <laughs> if that's not friendship, I don't know what is. Friendship is... Yeah, I don't know what friendship is, man. I don't know. <laughs> friendship is a fickle mistress. Obviously, I don't know what friendship is. <laughs> right? Um, well, uh, moving on to without a segue here. Uh, yeah. Was we right to surrender the city? Or would you think it would have been wiser to defend against the Fire Nation? Did Boom have, like, that big of an army? Well, I mean, seeing how he took back his city single-handedly, I don't think he needs that big an army to do what he did. Yeah. Well, so, but... <laughs> I mean, like, spoilers, but he only, <laughs> he only takes back it, the army when the, literally nobody can firebend. Yeah. So, no, no, I get like, that like, much, but, like, even if you ignore that, though, some of the earthbending feats he's doing are still, like, leagues above anyone else. Yeah, mm. but he's still one person against yeah. the whole... Like I, I, I understand like his method of surrendering to save the majority, like the, the, the majority of his people while waiting for the opportune moment to take back the city. Like it absolutely would require like a lot of foresight. And for a lot of people, it did of course look like Boomy just gave up and just didn't care. But mm -hmm. it, it, there is some wisdom in it. It just requires a lot of foresight. Yeah, he's playing the extra long game. Yep. Neutral Jing. There are actually 57 Jings, but this is this is neutral Jing. No, and we never hi find out what the other 57 are. <laughs> nope. Um, well, that's all I've got listed for questions for this episode. Is there anything else you guys want to hit up on this one that I missed? Um, I can't believe they got, they got Harley Quinn to voice the fucking baby. I know, right? <laughs> That, that kills me. <laughs> like, that's like such a wasted talent. <laughs> I love Dara Strong. She's just so good. This is probably back in the day when she was just taking any role she can get, maybe. Maybe. Because when did she actually start hitting it really big? I'm, I mean, she she <laughs> hit it really She's... big with, with Harley, didn't she? <laughs> Uh, I thought she She's was always been big. I, th I yeah. thought I thought she was. I thought she had a bigger role prior to Harley Quinn, though, because I think someone else was Harley Quinn. Then she took the role in Arkham <laughs> City after that person didn't want to come back. Arlene, right. Arlene Sorkin. That's who it was originally. Oh, she said she was big because she had fairly odd parents, Rugrats, uh, Powerpuff Girls, Ben Ten, Teen Titans. Uh, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. So yeah, why she wasted her time with a little baby that like, says two words? Look, don't you question Tara Strong. Oh, I'm gonna question it. <clears throat> don't you question her, she'll kill you. Oh yeah, I, I, Tara Strong, I challenge you to an Agni Kai. Come get me. Don't do that. <laughs> Come don't get me. Do that. Don't do that, you can't firebend. Oh, right, right, Aqua Kai, there we go, we'll do that, Aqua Kai. You can't waterbend either. I'll figure it out. It's fine. I just, I just, get, I'll, have, I'll have a bucket with me. It's fine. I've, I've, I've got some super soakers, man. 
I don't know if Bucket or Fuck It is going to get you out of this one. Oh, no. Oh, God. Bucket or Fuck It's going to get me out of this one. (laughs) (laughs) We'll roll on to the next episode with uh, Side... (laughs) We've run a Side B. We have have The Swamp. Originally airing April 14th, 2006. Uh, Written by Tim Hedrick and directed by... Uh, I fucking wrote the name wrong, Dan. But uh, Giancarlo Volpe. Not Sean Garlo. I don't know what the hell that was. Uh, <laughs> what? I don't know. My, my finger is being dumb, I guess. Uh, the, the animation duties. We're back to JM Animation. Uh, the cast includes uh, some new voices. William H. Bassett as uh, the Swamp Monster. Uh, Carlos Alas... Whatever. As Do and Co. <laughs> See, why don't you give him shit for mispronouncing? Never mind. See, no, 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 no. Ryan, Ryan, I got halfway and realized, oh no, this is a mistake, and I just stopped. <laughs> and then Joe Alasky as the one asshole who tried to attack Iroh. Nerd. Yep. Uh, we got some fun facts for you. Uh, Ryan, would you like to handle these fun facts? Yes, I got them. There are three, in fact. Who gaming enlightenment under the Banyan tree is similar to uh, Buddha's enlightenment? So that's a lovely, uh, a lovely callback there as well to uh, Buddhism and uh, mm-hmm. Asian culture there. Mm-hmm. Uh, ne- next up, the song that Iro sings at the beginning sounds similar to the song "It's a Long Way to Tipper." I don't know what that song is. I've heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of it. I don't remember anything about it, but I know I've heard it a couple times. All right. Well, it was uh, it's it's a reference to a song that exists. So, mm-hmm. fun fact. Hey, fun fact. <laughs> uh, last up, uh, the swamp seems mostly when shown above similar to the toxic jungle from Mr. Miyazaki's a uh, from Mr. Miyazaki's. I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, believe uh, that's in the script. Nausicaa Ryan, what's his first name? the Valley of the Wind. His name <laughs> is Mr. His first name is Mister because I don't believe I would be... his first name is Mister. I think <laughs> he has an actual so name. So improper to refer to him by his by his first name. <laughs> I will show him Isn't the respect. It more he is improper and I disrespectful will... to not say his first name. Absolutely not. I will I show him the respect. I think it is. Shares. Yep. So this is Mister Miyazaki's <laughs> Nausicaa Valley. Of the mm. I think you're disrespecting him by oh, just yeah. not saying his name. For the, for the, for the, what's funny? What's the, funny? Yeah, maybe, maybe. What's, what's funny <laughs> is when I when I when we started the night and you asked and I said no, I forgot about this episode. I totally did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got a synopsis for you too if you're ready for it. Yes, oh, yeah. please. I'm always ready. The gang stumbles on the remains of a Studio Ghibli production now haunted by swap monsters, ghosts, and screen birds. Everyone has a vision regarding their past or their future, and a swamp man tells them about spiritual power of the swamp, uh, the spiritual power of the swamp possesses, uh, while his buddies hunt down Appa for dinner. Meanwhile, Zuko and Iroh are broke and begging for money. Zuko gets fed up with the crime in Gotham and dons the blue spirit cowl once again, taking revenge on a crime in, his, in the name of his dead parents. Hmm. I, uh, I think I may mix something up here. Yep, I think so too. <laughs> I think so, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah. So, uh, pretty good A story. Pretty, pretty good B story setting up Zuko's uh, eventual turn to the dark side or light side or gray side mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, good stuff. Good whatever stuff. side. He's going to his side. He's going to the D twenty side. <laughs> yeah. Probably like eighteen, maybe. I mean, he's getting there. He's, like, maybe around a third. Thirteen. Yeah. He doesn't have any bonuses to add in yet. No, not yet. Not yet. G- give us a level up. He'll be fine. Mm. He'll be fine. Yeah. Um. So I got a few questions here in regards to this, uh, this episode. Uh, first yeah. first off, uh, for those who have seen Studio Ghibli movies, which I'm pretty sure is everyone here, uh, did you <laughs> yeah. Did you really get the vibes, uh, get, get those vibes from this episode? Uh, for those, uh, And I guess I can skip the second part because Chaz is not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, um in hindsight I think afterward for me I think afterward for me because it's been a while since I've seen Nuska. yeah so afterwards like it um it kind of hit me as I was 
like writing up some notes and thoughts. Oh, yeah, that... I think it was the same for me. Like, like, like in in hindsight, all the things that you mentioned, absolutely, they definitely yeah. feel like um like like Studio Ghibli. But yeah, we we haven't we we did the the uh, the Studio Ghibli marathon like years ago. So yeah, it's, yeah, a couple it's of hard years. Hard for fine. me to remember that one. Um. I get you. Uh, the re- the reason I click with it right away, not right away, but like it, 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 probably in hindsight, like I didn't think about it when watching it, but then when you go back and think about it, it's like, oh yeah, it does have that little vibe to it. Um, yeah. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, it's the big open vistas, like the, the, the wide landscape shots you see. Like they're not as finely detailed, I don't think, in this as they are in the Ghibli movies, but th- there's enough of a, a hint of that that you're like, okay, I, I could feel this being something that uh, Miyazaki would work on. Just, just a hint, just a hint of it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, next one uh, I got here for you. What are your thoughts on magical and/or haunted locations bringing fears and guilt to life as a story mechanic? You know, kind of like Silent Hill or what this place does. Yeah. I think it's a good <laughs> meta. I think it's a good meta uh, technique to really like get deeper into your characters uh, without uh, having something explicitly external happen that they have to kind of bounce off of. Like, mm-hmm. so it's just, it's a way to get deep into your character psyche, like, without having to explain a whole bunch of things beforehand as to why it's bringing this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, not, not to, uh, yeah. not to... Plus, I mean, who doesn't love silent? Oh, yeah, obviously. Obviously. Um, not not to drag it out, but uh, any particular uh, f- uh, favorite uses of this mechanic at all uh, in in other books, uh, comics, uh, games, movies, TV shows, etc. Mm. Um. Like I'll, I'll I'll be the basic bitch and say that I really uh, do love how yeah. Silent Hill Two does it because uh, it, it, it it tweaks what the first game does just enough to uh, make it so not not only is the main character experiencing the effects of Silent Hill, but everyone mm-hmm. else that you meet is also experiencing it. You just don't see their stories. And so you're kind of mm-hmm. left wondering if everyone's gone crazy, when really it's just like, oh no, everyone's seen their own shit, and it's fucking them up really bad. Yeah. Um, The one that kind of jumps to my mind, I don't know if it really counts as, like, magical, but, like, Doki Doki Literature okay. Club. Okay, okay. Because that, that can be some psychological horror disguised as a dating sim. Jesus. And uh, if I if I remember right, like one of the char- characters in the game is linked to a previous game that they did, which is kind of more Silent Hill esque. I think I remember hearing about that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Ryan, how about you? Um. So the one that is germane in my mind, probably because I I beat the game uh, in my replay of it a little while ago. Uh, But there's a sequence in God of War where uh, Kratos actually like is enveloped by this light, and it he sees a series of memories that he has of his wife who passed like right before the beginning of the game um and uh it's kind of overlaid with uh thoughts that his son has had of him so it kind of like while kratos is a very stoic figure who doesn't really speak unless like he's he needs to like say something it gives you you a good window into his grief and how he's handling the, the the rocky relationship with his son so but it, it does a lot of showing. It, I, I don't know if you call it showing or telling, but like it, it kind of straddles the line at that point because I think it depends on you, how you see that Kratos is dealing with it in his own way. I think it. I think it depends on how much exposition's in it, but for the most part, I would say it's probably showing. But um, um, another another example I want to bring up to, to mind that no one brought up because we all did video games. I'm like, we should probably think of something else here real quick. Um, <laughs> Scarecrow from Batman, I think, and even Mysterio yeah. in, in Spider-Man to an extent. Uh, they both yeah. use ah, el- yes. they both use illusions and fear gas and all that other shit to let mm-hmm. you d- dive deep into the mental state of the heroes. And I think that's really cool. 
Um, Scarecrow specifically does a really good job with that quite a bit in the comics, cartoons, and of course the games and movies. So yeah, um, yeah, just, just wanted to bring that one up there in particular because I'm sure someone out there is like, "Oh, you didn't mention Scarecrow," and I wanted to make sure that was in there. Don't worry, guys. Well, I'm what sure was we'll that see it in the comments. <laughs> that was that, that, that was an internet guy who's like all mad about everything. Yeah. Don't don't worry, guy. I got your back. Now now stop typing that <laughs> shit. Oh no, uh, I still hear him typing. Oh yeah, he's typing out something else. Probably that I made fun yeah. of him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is your impression of the Foggy Swamp style of bending? And what other variations of bending would you like to see more of? Um. Well, I thought it was really, really inventive. Um, and I... Like, it's... like it, It's enough... Another, it's another thing that makes the world feel more lived in because yeah. you're like not every form of bending is going to be the same um, the people who learned how to water bend in the Arctic uh, are gonna be water bending differently than the people that grew up in the swamp uh, so you also get to tie some cultural recognition in there and you make your world feel more diverse. They're still water bending, but they're doing it in ways that the people in the Arctic never would have imagined because they don't have a bunch of vines that are constantly absorbing water around them at yeah. every at every point. So I thought it was really, really cool and inventive the way they did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to to just touch on their culture a little bit, uh, Ryan, just remember, pants are an illusion and so is death. <laughs> I got dark. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what's worse, though? I, I, would, I would say it's definitely the, the death, elute, the, the embodiment of death wearing pants. Like, that's not a yeah. thing. That's, a, that's an illusion. Get rid of it. It's mm-hmm. not real. Get rid of it. Yeah. Who wears pants? Certainly not a skeleton, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh my god. But Ryan... <laughs> You wouldn't know anything about that, would he? You're right. I have. I, I wouldn't know anything about skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Um, no, I really like it though. So, so this is like a prelude to what we'll see eventually in season three with a certain uh, bender who will not be named right now, uh, mm-hmm. who uh, really shows us the depths of how far water Betty can actually get. Um, oh yeah. And uh, I really like this as a good setup for that to, to an extent. Like it's not a direct setup, but like it shows that. Water bending isn't just directly. Oh, I see water. Splish splash. No, there, there, there's another layer to it. You can, you can, you can move water wherever it is as long as you're, you know, aware of where it is and it within plants. Yeah, yeah totally a thing. Um, yeah, well, it's a, it's a setup for like other how complex bending can be. It's not just so straightforward. Yeah, really. It, 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 to, to quote uh, Rick Sanchez, it's about opening your mind to the possibilities here, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, next question I got here for you. Is Zuko right for reviving the blue spirit persona and becoming the thief? Or becoming a thief? Why or why not? No. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Yes. Explain, oh, explain, yeah. Ryan, explain. Feeling's wrong, guys. But Ryan, if God didn't want me to steal, why would he put oh, such valuable God. things around me? That's true. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> Look, I think it's another. So I think it's we're 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 taking uh, uh, Zuko's temperature again in terms of morality. You know, like uh, we're putting him in increasingly desperate situations, and we're seeing how his character reacts. You know, um, Iroh is reacting to it um, with uh, a kind of grace and a plum that's getting him through it. Uh, without causing harm to people around him, whereas Zuko will kind of, like he will instinctively harm people if it gets him what he needs. He won't necessarily enjoy it, but he may need to find a way to justify it. But there is that part of him that is okay with hurting other people if it means getting what he needs uh, done. So mm-hmm. I think uh, the blues like him like putting on the mask mask and robbing people like it be it's a, another like another way to shine a light on where he is uh where he is 
from a moral standpoint currently. Mm-hmm. Nicole, what do you think? I, mean, I agree with Ryan, but also, who wouldn't want to dress up and just go into the streets? Who wouldn't just want to be Batman for a little bit? Just, just a little bit. Um, just a little bit. So, Nicole, you weren't in the episode when we talked about it, but uh, so we uh, had some fun facts that revealed that the blue spirit mm-hmm. mask is actually a relic left behind by Zuko's mom. Oh. Yeah, he finds it in the, uh, in the I guess, mansion or castle or whatever uh, mm-hmm. after she leaves, and uh, it's like part of the theater productions that she would support, and so he just kept it. Mm-hmm. And that's why he, he uses it all the time. I wonder if his mom would be okay with him robbing people. I mean, she hmm. she killed yeah. an old man to well. save his life, so probably. <laughs> she killed the tie. Okay, you know what? Nope, you're yeah. gonna drag me into it. Nope, 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 nope. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So you agree? This is this is I I. I I have no comment. L- listen, <laughs> listen, Ryan. No comment. Listen, Ryan. The whole, the whole, I don't know what their last names are. The Hotmans, the Hotman family, they're all fucked up. <laughs> the Hotmans. They're all, their whole family is fucked up. Azula Hotman and Ozai Hotman, I mean, th- th- their morality is all fucked up. <laughs> Ozai Hotman. I, 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 like, that, that's, how, that's how I'm thinking of him from here on out. Oh my god, his name is Zuko Hotman. <laughs> Zuko Hotman. Zuko Hotman. <laughs> Yes. The only reason I think I call him that is because I remember there was one time when uh, I, I calls him Sifu Hotman. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. And I'm like that sticks. That sticks. Yeah. Like, yep. That's it. That's 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 what his name is now. That's what his name is now. Yep. Hotman. Stupid, sexy Hotman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I read that in a fanfic. Probably, probably a thing. <clears throat> um. <laughs> You know, I'm almost tempted because I don't think we've actually planned out any uh, any patron exclusive episodes. I'm almost t- tempted to do a patron episode just doing the uh, comic about Zuko's mom. I think that'd be kind of fun, but uh, that would be good. But, but we have to plan out when that would be because uh, that we have to probably set some time to read that. But uh, I, I'm down mm-hmm. for it. I'm down for it. Yeah, yeah. The season takes some weird turns. We went from movies to TV shows. Now we'll be doing like reading. I mean, come on, who does that? <laughs> reads. Who reads? Um, yeah. Looking at you, Ryan. <laughs> I haven't gotten to read since I've been working at home. There's no way. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. If I if I, if I actually pick up a book for pleasure, I'm gonna lose my job. I'm just not gonna work. I mean, there's worse things that could happen. <laughs> there's worse things that could happen. Yeah. Speaking of it's which, true. you could be wearing pants. Speaking of which, uh, Nicole, you you segued perfectly to my next question. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that time and death are merely illusions? Why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> we're getting deep today huh boys I mean hey you know what Swamp Man uh, Hugh got deep so Apparently. we're gonna get deep too yeah that's true don't, don't everyone all step up at once oh man <laughs> I I don't know I don't know if I believe in the concept of reincarnation uh, in which um, there exists a chance for you to return to this world and this life after you die. Um, but the idea that when when people pass on, they still exist in your memory and in the love that you had for them and the, the lessons that they've taught you, um, the memories that you hold dear like I think in those ways uh, time and death can be an illusion um, because like I think it, it's it goes to the the point of how we are all connected and the things that divide us such as time and death but also such as nations and races and uh, this person can bend fire and this person can bend water all of those things are nothing when compared to the things that connect us all. So the the things that separate us are are far outweighed by the things that bring us together. So in those ways, rather than a kind of concrete metaphysical 
belief, I do think that time and death can be a an illusion. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Nicole, what do you got? Um, to an extent, I think that time and death are an illusion. Just um, as a sense of like almost unchaining a person to uh, achieve. Like, achieve actually what they want. Because, like, you see it a lot with, like, time. Like, oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. But do, do you actually? Like, I, I've i been living by, like, this thing where if it takes five minutes or less, I don't put it off. I just do it. I try, at least for me, I try to... I don't know, look at things as if get get a little bit of gray into my uh, messed up head of black and white. Or things mm-hmm. are not always as as they appear sometimes. Hmm. Alright, alright. Mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think I've got a, a somewhat op- op- uh, opposing viewpoint a bit to you guys, but um, mm-hmm. um I, I understand the the concept of time being a a man made construct. I.e., we invented it to track things. It doesn't actually exist, or it's not like a thing you can actually hold and grab onto. And arguably, death is also not something you can grab and hold onto. It's something we just uh, defined and designated as. Oh, hey, you're either this or you're that. You're you're alive or you're dead. Um, but I look at it as time is kind of like a resource almost, in that. Everyone has a finite amount of time in them. They don't know what that finite amount of time is. Um, it's it, it, it's it, and it's kind of like your money and your health and all this other stuff. Like it's a meter almost. Except unlike your your money or to an extent your health, you don't know what the 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 uh, the, the full value of your time meter is. All you know is it's just constantly dwindling down day after day. And so, uh, things you do need to make the most value of that because it's arguably the most valuable resource it might be the one you have the most of depending on who you are but it's also the only resource you can never get back it's the only one you can ever build back up if it ever hits zero and so it's one of those things where I view it not necessarily like it's like the most important thing but it's definitely one of those resources like you've got to make the most of it as you can because it's definitely got a very high value based on how it can't be re- ever re- rebuilt, you know. Mm-hmm. I like that. No, I do. I like that too. Yeah. Hence, why I want to be a time vampire and suck the time from people who st- waste my time. <laughs> Damn you, old woman at the yeah, right. at the shopping market, making me wait for your yep. freaking coupons and pennies. <laughs> all the time that I'm all the time that I'm wasting, and as a customer service agent, just ugh. All that time you're sitting in ugh. traffic. Yeah. What traffic? I'm at home. All oh, right. Yeah, I forget. You're you're home still trapped traffic. at home. Home, home traffic. traffic. Yeah. The traffic from your you couch to your bathroom. Traffic, Ryan? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some sometimes I move to my coffee table and then it gets in my way as I try to turn on the TV and I'm like, "Fuck, move! What are you exactly. doing? The light, the light, the screen." Sorry. Ryan, we we hey, need to get hey, you hey. out. We, we need to get you out of your apartment. I think you're gonna get stir crazy. I think yeah, he's already to, stir crazy. And I need to go for a walk. There's a beach like two blocks away. I need to just go and look at the water for a while. Yeah. Now I was talking with Chaz the other day. We need to get y'all out here one of these days for like a get together again soon. Not like mm-hmm. you know in the next week or two, but like whatever. What as soon as the uh, as the apocalypse is over, we got to get y'all out here. Yeah. As mm-hmm. soon as it once is, we get past it is plague. less Rona hours. Yeah. Once we get past the plague, then we can actually like do stuff. Because, yeah, it seems weird to have a year where I don't see you guys at all. Yeah. Aww, we miss you too. Aww. Gross. <laughs> um, and if y'all uh, miss us out there, uh, don't don't worry. You can always reach out to us <laughs> on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also email mm-hmm. us directly. Ryan, if they miss us that much, where can they email us at? Uh, they can email us at waterbendinghillbillies at your... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that's evacstation at gmail.com. Uh, that is a spinoff sequel to the Beverly Hillbillies, just so everyone knows. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, so this is where we rank the episodes from uh, platinum to bronze, all the colors in between. 
Where do y'all want to mm-hmm. rank the first one, which was Return to Amashu? Uh, that one. Um. Hmm. That. I'm trying to remember like the whole thing now because it's been a while since. You want me to go first? Yeah, because I'm trying to segment it in my head, just like as just that episode and not like blurred with everything else. No, I get you. Yeah. I get you. Yeah. Um. No, I think this was. I think uh, the. I think Return to Omashu is a fun episode. Um, and it adds to. It, it, it's more set up. It's more set up. I wouldn't say it's as good set up as, uh, excuse me, as the the first episode of the series. Uh, but it's definitely putting pieces into play. We realize, okay, Boomy's not going to be the be Aang's teacher. Uh, we get to see Azula as like the actual central antagonist that she's going to become mm-hmm. for both Aang and for uh, Zuko as well. Uh, we get to see Azula's angels, and Ty Lee <laughs> just gets to fuck people up with. That's with really Chino. all you wanted, Ryan. Yeah, Azula's angels are pretty cool. They're pretty. They're yeah. pretty. They're pretty legit. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, I think I would give this one a high bronze. Um, again, it's not a bad episode by any means, but the episodes coming up are much better, and it does its job in setting the those pieces where they need to be and explaining why things are going to unfold the way they do but it doesn't do much beyond that so yeah mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah I think you're right in that just uh, there's a lot of setup needed for what's gonna go down mm-hmm. and so it's not necessarily bad just like um like I'm just thinking of Boomy and as just Nick Cage's face now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm probably gonna I... read it, like, maybe, um, two knives in my sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> she's going for the Conan, too. She's going for the Conan O'Brien approach. <laughs> yeah? I like it. I like it. I, I do love Conan. Um... I'd say for me, it's probably a bronze. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that here that's set up. It, it, as, you, as you said, Ryan, it's not as polished and not as strong as the first episode of the season. Um, but it does do a lot of good stuff to get the pieces in play. Um, I would say there's a couple episodes later that really showcase how scary or how tough that Ty Lee, May, and Azula are going to be. Um, and oh, yeah. And, and we'll get to those later. Yeah. Um, I'd say what really like lacks has it lacking for me is just I don't think the central plot is super strong, i.e. Boomy giving up the city and the whole um, revolution escaping just because they have some dots on their face. Like, There's a lot of like little things that are just a little too goofy but to, to work for me, but I don't hate them. Um, all- to box. Also, <laughs> also the lack of Zuko. There's lack of Zuko here. That's yeah. true. But we did get Sokka. Yeah, we did. We did. Inventing a plague. <laughs> But yeah. that's where, that's where but, yeah, Corona yeah, started. Sucka invented the coronavirus. I'm done. I'm done. Um, <laughs> Don't you dare! Don't you dare! Uh, episode two, uh, episode four. Sorry, uh, the swamp uh, rankings. Where do you want to put this one at? Um, I'd say it's also a bronze for me. Um, it it feels like it's kind of straddling the line between filler and plot because. This is where we. This is where Aang is essentially shown by the world and by the forest who his teacher is going to be, and points him top's way. Uh, but we also get filler, as in like, what exactly is Zuko like? Like, like where's Zuko at mentally and morally right now? So again, a good episode. Uh, definitely sets stuff up and sets things into motion uh we Mm -hmm. see him we see the blue spirit is going to be playing a role in this in this season Mm -hmm. um and we get our first glimpse at toff along with hillbilly waterbenders hilarious to me um but yeah um it paves the way for much better episodes it's still a good episode but in comparison to where we're going yeah it's still a bronze a high bronze 
Yeah. I agree. I'm I love the swamp vendors. Um and just everything just everything that it's setting up. I think I'm gonna give this episode um uh like t- two pairs of pants in the tr- <laughs> trash. <laughs> um I was expecting like three swamp leaves or, or three vines. No, no, that's dumb, Ryan. Or or, or two screaming <laughs> Forgive birds. Me. Right. Forgive um, me. Sorry. That was stupid. So I'm gonna be weird here. I'm gonna go yeah. I'm gonna go high silver. I wanna Ooh. give it a gold, but I, I think it needs a bit more like streamlining and more focus before I could do that. Um, okay. I really mm-hmm. like the swamp mechanics. I know it, I, I'm, I'm an easy sell, but like I think it, it visually everything looks great here. This is a visually beautiful episode. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that the the mechanics of the of what the swamp shows you and the visions people have, I think that's always been a, a thing I've loved. I mean, you guys know me. Scarecrow's one of my favorite villains, and so is Mysterio and yeah. Silent Hill and all that. So, um, I would say that there's a few things I'd trim down. I'd say Zuko's whole thing could be its own episode, like not this thing but like you could just do a whole episode with Zuko of Zuko and Iroh's misadventures and, <laughs> and, and, and I mean we, we will get Zuko yes. alone after a while I know I know yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that there's enough stuff happening there that you could probably separate it from this and just make it its own episode um you, yeah the, the swamp benders it, it, great in concept I think in execution there's a little bit something missing I'm not sure what but I, I don't know um them hunting out Appa seems silly to me just because like Oh hey, big flying bison with a big arrow on its head, huh? Probably belongs to someone with a lot of stuff on his back. You would think? And they're still hunting it anyway. Food. It, it, food. It, it, it's crazy. Food. It's, it's crazy. Well, you see how big he is. That's a lot of food. But there's stuff on his back. Someone owns him. Yeah. So dibs. <laughs> um, but then this this episode also uh, introduces some uh, very abstract concepts that I think are gonna. Not necessarily play a big role, but they're definitely going to start indicating that the show is taking on some deeper, more philosophical stuff as the season progresses, and I'm looking forward mm-hmm. to that. So, overall, not a favorite, but definitely one of the seasons. Like first, like okay, I'm I'm ready for this. Let's do it. Episodes. Mm, yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Well, uh, that is all for this week's uh, episodes. Tune in next week, and I'm bringing up the list here. I know what one of them is. I turn what the other one was. Uh, tune in next week. It's time. It's time. <laughs> next week, we're going to be ready for a uh, a bit of a Royal Rumble, if you will, uh, with yeah. uh, Avatar Day and the episode I think we've all been waiting for, The Blind Bandit. Hell yeah. Oh, blind Bandit. I'm so ready for her to take the stage. Mm-hmm. Live on pay-per-view. Live on pay-per-view. Here's the thing. I don't know if the blind bandit. You can, you can, you can get you can get the pay per view. You can get the pay per view for an undisclosed amount mm. on 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 uh, Earthbending Network. Or you can go to patreoncom so just cast directions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I don't know if it's my favorite episode, but it is a contender. It is up there. It is, it's 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 mm-hmm. it's gonna be a fun one to talk about. I'm, I'm hoping everyone shows up because I have I have an intro plan for it. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Ooh. Uh, but uh, you'll only find that out if you tune in next week. So we'll see you after the credits. Bye. Bye. Bye.